Welcome to Business Unveiled Podcast. This is the place where we help overwhelmed, time-starved entrepreneurs like you make the profitable shifts to get more done and get more out of life. I'm your host, Angela Prophet, award-winning eight-figure entrepreneur and CEO. And in every episode of Business Unveiled, I'm bringing you conversations that will give you the expertise and strategies that will scale your team and business so you can get shit done. That's GSD in our world. So get your time back and grow a business that helps you be present in your life. Let's do this, y'all. Hi, y'all. It's Angela. I'm back for another episode of Business Unveiled. And I'm so excited for our guest today because I should have been recording when we first started talking. We were talking about dry shampoo and we literally are so similar in like how we like to schedule things and then get back to in-person meetings. And we were just chattering away. It was so much fun. But Hilani, welcome to the show today. Hello there. Thank you so much, Angela, for having me today. Um, I'm actually kind of at a loss for words. I'm usually the host of my own podcast. So I got to kind of do that mind shift being the guest and being here and spending time with you. And I love your energy. I'm very excited about this time that we're going to be spending together. And I have to disclose right here at the front, you had me at GSD. You had me at get shit done. That's just, that's, that's my language. And I was revisiting your bio today and remembering uh, some really awesome things where you're a Southern gal with a potty mouth. So I'm, I'm glad to be in your company. I'm of the same. I don't, I'm from Florida. I've heard we can't say we're from the South, even though we're Southern than where you are. Uh, But I am, I'm from that Florida area. I'm actually coming to you live now from Denver. So that's Thank awesome. you so much for having me. <laughs> and, and we were just chatting you guys. We both were just in Cabo and yes. we were talking about how awesome it is and how the energy is and like mm-hmm. the sun just, I don't know, mm-hmm. it does something to you there. I mm-hmm. absolutely love it. But before we kick off, I want, and, and really I, there's so many cool takeaways from the company that you have started and like how you're helping so many businesses thrive before we mm-hmm. jump off. I would love for you to share a little bit more about like your background and your journey and anyone who's watching or listening, it's really important to me that people understand, like you just didn't roll out of bed, start this great business and like shit's working. It's like, That's so true. That's so like true. That. So yeah. what's some of your background? Oh, I'm excited for the question. Cause every now and then you do need to, for the listeners, wherever you are in your journey, you do need to stop and think, where have I traveled? Where have I, you know, fallen down on my face or been able to jump over that hurdle and keep moving forward? So I appreciate the question because not often do we stop and go, holy shit, you know, where have I actually been and what am I kind of doing and where am I going? So thank you for the question. Um, you know, I've always been someone, I'm an Aries. We were just covering that before we started recording. There is something so innate in my personality that I am always in a position to serve, which I am happy to admit I'm a recovering people pleaser. Uh, so for any of those out there that are on that journey, uh, you're in good company here today with Angela and I, and I'm 42. I'm always happy to admit how old I am because I appreciate getting older. It makes me wiser. And we also mentioned this before we started recording. I had those wisdom lines, which is called gray hair. Those got covered up just recently. I've always been an individual that appreciates helping others. And there's something really beautiful. I've actually got goosebumps saying it. Something really beautiful about the return on that. And for me, it's extremely authentic. Um, Second to being a recovering people pleaser, I learned the word no in the last 10 years. And it's extremely life-giving on how to use it. I um, am an only child. I was in theater a lot. I was varsity cheer captain in high school. You know, I was someone that would always be babysitting, helping with the dishes and had no problem uh, with doing those things of service. And it definitely teed me up for my very first big girl job, which was an executive and personal assistant to a well-known writer, voice, radio personality. Uh, Her name is Dr. Laura Schlesinger. And this was well before the iPhone. I had a, a Franklin Covey journal and multiple pencils and erasers and pencil sharpeners in my bag. 
And it was really where I had no idea about the profession as an administrative individual, but it was made for me in my personality. I did waitressing uh, throughout high school. I did not finish college. Um, and I'm always comfortable now later in life admitting that, whereas I thought it was a deficiency. And I have street smarts that are extremely creative that have propelled me forward and been each um, th those types of things about me that are natural have helped me get through my own hurdles. I'm a mom. Uh, I've been married here in 2021, now almost uh, 21 years. And there is, uh, by the way, no book that helps you get this far. And I have two boys, which is awesome. My oldest is driving and I'm looking, I'm like, what the fuck is this? Oh my You're God, driving? that's crazy. Are you Yeah, afraid? it's awesome though. No, not really. I'll be curious when my younger starts driving, although I think he'll be, um, he'll be great. Both boys are great. I don't have that house where it's like, oh my God, you have boys. What's that like? And it's pretty awesome. So we're definitely in that transition to becoming friends a little bit more on that percentage versus parenting. Um, so I'm a mom. Um, I left uh, the corporate world um, being an executive assistant to stay at home and be the CEO of the house. And I did it in a way that was unconventional. You know, I was reading books early on. I viewed it as a job. And so my natural habits of being a hustler uh, definitely came into the home and my husband was working and we were doing that, you know, single income with kids. And it was amazing. We left California to be here in Colorado, where we've been now for 13 years. And there was a point at that time where I said, I need to revisit my full purpose in life, and it's to be of service. And so I had applied to an executive and personal assistant role, like late in the night. And I was running a very small boutique business, sewing products. You know, I had a shop on Etsy. I had a blog. I didn't have a podcast then because it wasn't popular, but I had a Facebook page and just all these really great things. And that kept me engaged in what made me me. And so for anyone who's starting out their business, you know, you should be mind mapping what makes you feel alive inside and finding those small tentacles of, you know, what can help you feel that sense of purpose. So I took that executive and personal assistant role, which is essentially what's going to lead me to what I'm doing today. And um, I'm very proud to announce, and this isn't in a position of overconfidence, but I'm really fucking good at doing that role. And uh, there's areas I'm not great at. Um, I would rather uh, go to the dentist than, than do you know anything in Excel and accounting. Uh, that is not my jam. And I own it. I own it. And I'm okay with it. However, with being a high functioning executive and personal assistant, you have to have that. So I took extra time to try to not make a lot of mistakes. So I, I landed an interview and I realized when I got that job, I hadn't interviewed in 12 years. And so when I left that first interview, because I worked for four, stayed home for eight. And so I hadn't interviewed and I was like, it's time to be a big girl again and get your big girl clothes on, get your hair done and makeup. And, and I, I wasn't sloppy at home. Yes, there were days I was in sweats, but closing out the story, it was really beautiful to have touch points with very big people in the community on behalf of my executive. And having been from Los Angeles, actually being in the entertainment industry, I believed that that gave me just a, um, an edge to my voice, an edge to my hospitable nature that wasn't common here in Colorado. So I stood out to the leaders I was interacting with on behalf of my executive and a couple of them said, where did you find her? I'm gonna need me one of those. And so they asked for my assistance in helping them find their strategic business partner, which could be known as an executive assistant. And it wasn't until the summer of 2016, where I was in my fourth year in that EA personal assistant role, where I was like talking to my executive, I said, something's going on in the community. I'm feeling very drawn to be of service in a different way. I think I need to pay more attention to these now introductions that started happening like once a quarter, like, hey, I heard about you. Can you help me too? And I was doing it all pro bono and I was doing it in a very uh, light manner considering how in-depth my manner is now four years into running this company. And I left the corporate world in the summer of 2017 and I've been wonderfully hustling since. And I heard from a client last week, you only get burnt out if you don't like what you're doing. And I had to pause and think about that. 
I don't get burnt out. It's a very emotional space to be a headhunter. You're dealing with people, money, job, where we spend so much of our time. So I've launched a company. It's called Exceptional Admins. And my past executive, got to give him credit. He was the one that came up with the name because the abbreviation is EA, like executive assistant. And so I'm in my fifth year now. Yeah, here in 2021. Mm -hmm. And I'm close to uh, completing 100 placements in less than uh, five years, which is very exciting. Yeah, for me, I view business growth. So this is a tip for the listeners. A lot of people are promoted um, by the outside, CNBC, Squawk Box, you know, Market Watch, that revenue tells you if you're successful. And when I see applications for, uh, you know, getting recognized for an award and they want a minimum of a million, I'm thinking I'm, I'm not available for that yet, but I truly believe that every time the phone rings, oh, I've heard about you, Hilani, and I'd love to work with you. That is a measurement of success for me. So I hope we get to cover that um, at any point during our discussion uh, and just kind of like the varying ways to view different things as a business owner. So I'm running exceptional admins. I've got three different things. I really provide the the community, it's permanent placement for, for individuals. I have consulting, which is also connected to a workshop that just launched this year, EA University. Um, creatively, I have uh, some articles I write every now and then. I have my own podcast. And so I, I'm not trying to be all things for all people, but I am continually trying to find channels to give my wisdom and the things that I learn on a daily basis out into the ears of um, and the eyes, if they're reading the article, uh, to those out into the community. So that's my story. Yeah. I love it. And Thank what you. you're doing is so needed. And much like you have probably heard a gazillion times, like I, let's see, for the last 20 years, I've had three main like right hands, like literally like they're my right hand Mm -hmm. and, and they are very loyal and they're awesome and they stay and they grow and they pivot. But there are a lot of friends that I have who are entrepreneurs and they say over and over, I need an Amanda. I need an Amanda. Where did you find Amanda? I need an Amanda. But it's like, strategically from psychology, I know what type of brain makeup I need to have, but Mm -hmm. no one taught me that. I learned that through working in a mental hospital, which not everybody has that background. Yeah. Yeah. And so understanding like how that person needs to be communicated with is so important. And so I remember years ago when VAs first started coming out and it was like, Oh, I'm going to get a virtual assistant. They're going to fix everything right. personally, and professionally. Yeah. And then a couple of years would go by and then I would listen to my friends at dinners, bitch and complain about, well, that VA, that just, shit's not working out. And I'm like, but time out, why is it not mm-hmm. working out? Mm-hmm. And the reason it's not working out is because you as the leader don't want to train them, put the time <laughs> and the effort And it's all, that's always, but it's like, until I'll say say that to their face, they're like, oh shit, maybe it is me. And then there's people who are just, you know, they'll never listen. Those people are not around my circle, but it's like, you know, I have to take a step back and always like, even as a leader, we are serving others. And if we can't serve our VAs and our EAs and our assistants and our how are they going to serve our clients if we're not Mm -hmm. training them and teaching them and leading them? And so what I have learned just through experience is it comes down to like training and placing the right people in the right places. So if, if someone uses a company like yours, you do all that work for them. Mm -hmm. and then place them and it's Mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. So like now, even after the pandemic, and I think during the pandemic, a lot of people realize like, oh shit, I need to figure out how to work with, with an EA or a VA, like over technology. Right. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. And they've had to learn how to train a whole different way. So are there any insights or strategies or something that you can 
like your top three things that you look for. If there's someone listening or watching and they're like, oh my God, I know I need to hire somebody. I know I need to do it. Like I'm drowning yeah. and just, it's like, you can't do it all by yourself. People, mm-hmm. what would you say to them in terms of if they're looking for somebody, like, what are some things that you have learned over the years in your company? Like these are non-negotiables. Like these are things that I have to do. How long, how much time do we have for the recording? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, girlfriend, we don't have all day. I know. And, and I, and I love how this love is it. teed up. Cause I sort of mentioned it earlier in my story. There is, and, and I'm going to start with a negative, but I'm going to close on a positive. So everyone yeah. stay with me. There is no playbook now to your question of three things. I'd like to get to that in a moment before I tee up some philosophy changes that need to happen. A lot of the work that I do is helping uh, advance the mindset of a client to the today's assistant. A lot of the times, and when I, prior to COVID, right, I was out business development, like heels. I don't even know what those are now, but heels, you know, out and about. And a lot of the times people would say, oh my gosh, Halani, I love what you're doing. But I, I don't want to bring that in. It's more work to train and you use the word train. And so I'll talk on that. It's more to train someone than to just do it myself. And that actually is a beautiful gateway to a discussion on time productivity, which is what your purpose is every day. Mm -hmm. And for me, and you had this in your bio and I loved it. Where's your energy going? We need to have the replacement for time management of energy management, right? What's being called of me and where is my output? There is no playbook. However, there are two types of administrative individuals and both serve a purpose in the professional community. One is conveyor belt, which it sounds like from the example that you gave, you know, they would receive a task from Angela and execute and be done. The strategic individual is I, Angela, that doesn't really connect with what we're, our goals are this week or next week. You know, where does this line up with what you're working on in your head that you haven't shared with me yet? Because it's about, and you said it, communication and the why. And when an executive says to me, and this is the word training, please don't bring me someone I need to train. I try to break that up and say, uh, it's either training or education, right? Context, context is so key and it is unfortunate and it happens all the time. So for any of you listening and you're about to say, oh shit, that was me. You just assume they know it and they figured it out and they're in your head and you've only been with them, your VA 10 hours a week for the last three weeks. And you're like, well, they should know my business and they don't. So there's a context uh, discrepancy, which, so for training, it's like, let's say Angela uses, uh, you know, a new CRM, you know, she's tracking all of her activities. We need to train Hilani, your assistant on that CRM. That is training. So when the executive says training, I say, we either have training or we have education. You're telling me ultimately with that statement is you don't want to spend the time necessary to educate them. You have historical knowledge in your role as an individual and usually I'm working with CEOs of large companies, lots of new entrepreneurs this year, which is great, right? Because their business is booming. I'm like, where are you at with a threshold of patience for the fact that you, for the next six months, when this person joins you, is going to be siphoning from you a significant amount of context that they don't have to get up to speed. So that beautiful cadence of back and forth is getting stuff done. And the things that I like to tell people if they're exploring a part-time or full-time hire, one of the top questions you should ask, even in the very first interview is, this is one of three from a suggestion and wisdom standpoint, um, Sarah, uh, you know, you don't have executive assistant in your background. Tell me what from your background intersects with the needs of this role. If they are too general, well, you know, I'm really great with people and um, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, put events together because I do appreciate people that come from the hospitality background and join in administrative roles. They've got a lot to offer. If that's the answer you're hearing, they don't have their administrative voice, which means they won't have the strength necessary to be able to execute administratively. 
if their answer is, well, calendar is king. And I want to learn everything about your calendar, who you spend time with, what's the frequency, you know, where you regularly eat lunch, the calendar is where I'm going to become a subject matter expert in the first 30 days. So if you start asking me to run reports, I may not view that as important, even though that's important to you because I don't have context. The calendar as king, we can look back to the last five months of, you know, where's Angela been spending time? How many times has she talked to Sarah? And why did we only talk to Julie once? What's the context of that? And really kind of getting into that today. So asking that question is, where do you see yourself as the assistant focusing? And that still applies to a virtual part-time person. The next uh, question is, and I actually use this on both ways, both the client can ask this and an assistant can ask this. And this is very vulnerable and this allows for authentic discussion. Um, the executive can say, or the entrepreneur, where do you think in, hoping you've done research, Angela, on the company, where do you think you might make your first mistake? And that question trips everyone up and it's good. And the reason we wanna ask that is twofold. How do they physically, respond, right? Do they start to move in their chair too much because they don't have the answer, which likely means they didn't do a lot of research. They're not invested in what you're doing. You know, uh, their stocking is not established, which for me, being a heavy stalker equates to being resourceful, um, which, and I'm sharing a lot of wisdom, which everyone's trying to digest. And maybe you've pulled over to start writing some of this down. It's key because we need to think differently about interviewing. And it comes down to the context. It comes down to personable and, and um, actually being confident with that question of where you're going to make your first mistake. And a great answer is, I may trip up. If you have two Steves you talk to a lot, I may confuse them. And that's, he that's healthy and human. Um, and if that's their answer, that's great. And they've already figured out that you're dealing with a lot of clients, um, they may say, you know, hey, I learned in the past to triple check X and Y. You've just learned that they're developing because they've given their answer. The third thing is, and it kind of goes to small teams having culture. Um, I like to ask, a, to me, culture does not mean uh, beer pong and a wine in the fridge and shit like that. Yeah. Culture, culture is, is what does a company do um, and Leah, my assistant and I work, we're, we're a culture of two people, you know, what are we doing? Uh, we could be found praying maybe when we have an issue with the client, uh, we can be found laughing when we're like, uh, really that's, that's okay. Let's move it. Let's bless that part and move along. And, um, there's a variety of things that can come up. And so culture is really a neat thing. And if you are a one person entrepreneurial environment and you are looking for that second, right arm, left brain person. Um, what do you do, Angela, to recharge is a great question to ask. If they know how to stay high functioning, they know if they're like, oh, I'm a workhorse, that's going to be great for you. But are they going to be able to recharge? You know, are they a person that reads leadership books? How are they going to invest? There's some beautiful things that have come from my relationship with Leah where I use now and I give her full credit for it. She's like, wow, that call was very life-giving. And when we're giving offers to candidates or I have to make the hard calls of, I'm sorry, they're not moving forward with you, even though that's a negative call, it's life-giving because they're like, well, thank you for helping me so far along in the process. And that's still being a servant, even though the outcome for the candidate isn't what they desired. So uh, while it's a very long answer, I sure hope that the listeners were able to pull one or multiple things from what I shared. Oh my gosh, just the interview questions alone. Like I don't do interviews anymore, but how we were able to grow our team, which this was a, a uh, who's still manage our business manager who said, you have to start an internship program and I saw that so, on the website. Yeah. Mm -hmm, but that came out of me having 12 employees and I was in healthcare and ran, ran a business and taught gymnastics. I don't even know what, how I did all this, but wow, I just was like an opportunity presented itself. And I'm like, I need to choose, like, I'm going to jump ship out of corporate America and 
the direct deposit every two weeks and the bonuses and try this entrepreneur thing. And if it doesn't work, I can always go back to healthcare. That's right. But, and, and then when I told the people, I had a big Christmas party at my house and I was so mm. excited that I just built a new house and, and basically designed it to do design for all of our events and, and crazy oh, shit. Mm -hmm. And then, but the response that I was expecting versus what I got was two different things. And so pretty much every single person sitting there at that party, besides my sister, um, the way they responded to me saying like, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving healthcare. I'm going to do this full time. Um, they took it very negatively. Like, are you going to take jobs away from us? Are we not going to work every weekend? Like, what do you mean? And then they all got together and there were like separate little, uh, teams and they sent me emails cause they got real bold mm. and told me that I didn't pay them enough. And keyboard um, warriors you know, love those. Uh -huh, yeah. All these uh -huh. things. And I was crushed. I was like, yeah. I pay more hourly than anybody in the city to do an event you don't sit up all night. You don't plan the shit behind the scenes. You show up with an iPad and run the show. You might be invested 15 hours where I'm invested 150 hours over a year. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry and so upset. My business manager's like, you have to let everyone go, go. You have to, they don't respect Bye -bye. you. They're yeah. not going to grow with you. And I'm like, I can't just let everyone go. I have, we have hundreds of events. Mm -hmm. I need mm. people to execute. And he's like, you got to start an internship program and those people you're going to teach them. And that's how you can prevent your team. And that's what I did. It was very hurtful, but it's one of the best things I ever did. And unfortunately, like I was, you know, using friends to help me build this company, which I didn't really know I was building a company at the time. Right. I'm not friends with any of them anymore, yeah. but it's like those hurtful things have to happen but now it's like having an intern program, we're able to see the proactiveness and make sure it's a good fit. And probably I would say a good 90% of them, they don't belong in hospitality. They think they want to, because it looks fun on TV, but like, then they get in it and they're like, this is hard. People yeah. are rude, mm -hmm. like, and they don't know how to respond. And so for us, like, pre-vetting people. It's like dating, right? So it's like, is this going to work? It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> so the true. Questions are so important to be able to ask. Like we do a psychology methodology, which mm. usually works. I use Myers-Briggs. Yeah. So you, you filled out one of our favorites and 50% of that is Myers-Briggs. Okay. The difference is that with Myers-Briggs, it usually is like you and the computer and it spits out results. And then you read your results and you interpret the results the way you want to interpret them. Yeah. But right. then the one we use is a team approach. So like everybody mm -hmm. goes off and like does the, the cluster and then they come back and it's like, okay, what color are you? And like, where are your numbers? Mm -hmm. And so like, when I looked at yours, which actually it, it, it's shocking because most EAs and BAs who are like just on it, they are really high gold, like in the twenties and your, but your highest, your brightest was orange just by one point. Okay. But what that tells me, like if I had met you five or six years ago and I saw this, I would be like, why do you not own your own business? Yeah. You know, it's like most, like I'm a high orange. And so most orange is like, we're entrepreneurs. Like we always know that there's something else, mm -hmm. but it's scary to like mm -hmm. branch off and like start your own thing. But your gold and your orange is so close together, but it's like the really high, high golds. Like they will never start a company yeah. because it's too risky, too risky. It, it's mm -hmm. way too risky. And they don't want to, they want to sleep well every single night and they don't mind the repetition and the, and the tradition of, yeah. of having a job, but it's more nowadays, it's more about like the quality of life. Who are your team members? Who's leading you? Like, what is that purpose? What is that? Why? 
but it's, it's funny because I can look at these personality results and kind of know right off the bat, like, okay, your brain's wired this way, but you're having to do this because Mm -hmm. you're thinking this. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and then you also mentioned too, that your husband was an entrepreneur, which when you have a partner involved, it makes it a little bit less risky. Mm -hmm. And if they're an entrepreneur too, like they're pushing you and supporting you because they understand that when you get into, I'm going to run a business, I'm going to start a business mode. Like you really flourish yeah. and you really love what you're doing. So even before talking with you, like I could look at that and I'm like, this is interesting. Like knowing what your business is. Uh-huh. And then now it makes sense to me why it's like, ah, oh, why hasn't this been up for 15 years? Right. And, but it's like, you have your shit together and you, you wanted to make sure you had your <laughs> shit together yeah. before you're going to go out and do it for other people. Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Just- yeah. I, I loved all of that. And I'm intrigued by that extra orange and it's interesting. Let this be a thought that's backed by the data of the assessment. You do have the chance and I don't like the word change. You do have the chance to evolve. Totally. And um, if I were to describe myself, I am, and my assistant Leah will comment on it. I'm pulling from my, my desire of service. Um, and I'm still kind of acting as an executive assistant to my CEO clients because I have deliverables, I have action items, I have information. I am luckily running the show and the timeline and what we're doing. And that is still very executive assistant in nature, but I'm also in the driver's seat. Um, I do sometimes not work with certain clients just based on that initial call. And I have a huge advocacy bone for the individuals on the candidate side who are my people that I'm working with. Um, Of the 95 I've done, only two, maybe three, two I remember that I personally would not have been their assistant. And I kind of have that box I want to check off when I'm talking to them initially would I want to be your assistant? Would I want you to call me or text me at 6 a.m.? And traditionally, I want to say yes to that, to take them on as a client, because then my liveliness and passion as the interim publicist who's verbally marketing the role, verbally speaking on your behalf, um, is really powerful. And that goes into what you mentioned with purpose. For me, having a high orange Um, I've, this is my third business. My first one was the handmade brand that I had mentioned. I was doing it while I was at home. It wasn't clearly the revenue generator that I have today, (laughs) Uh, but it was great. And it kept me intact with what made me, me. And so if you've been a stay at home mom and you're now moving into entrepreneurship, if you wake up and do your life the same as you did as a stay at home mom, you haven't evolved. And it's key to kind of think about, yeah, throw on some mascara and uh, get that dry shampoo out today. I have in a braid, right? Just something a little different to define that change, or as I just said, the evolution. Um, but then I'm, I'm happy to take risks. I actually wrote this down because on your website, um, what did you say? Rules are meant to be broken. Mm-hmm. I had this really cute meme that I've used on my Instagram page months and months ago. It is, and you maybe have seen it. It's uh, in black and white. It's five little ballerinas, right? They're all like three, four, and five, and six years old. And they're all standing ready to plie, except the one that's hanging upside down on the bar. And then the <laughs> caption says, be different. That was me. That was me. me and too. I was called out you know, early years of she can't sit still at parent teacher conferences, you know, she's always chit chatty. And it's unfortunate because we are still trying to dismiss this years later. I'm 42, as I mentioned, where I'm like, uh, I should have been viewed as a disruptor, an inventor, uh, uh, someone who's intuitive and thinking that doesn't want to follow the rules. So yeah, I can, that's why I believe being an entrepreneur, but then to your point about sleeping, which I laughed, um, I've said this before, anyone can start a business. It is the freedom of what America provides us. Anyone can start a business. It genuinely takes something very unique to prosper 
And again, to the very back comment I made, you need to identify how you want to label your business as successful and don't only use revenue as a measurement for that. And that will help give you some grace uh, when you're going through a period that may be a lull where you don't have traction from, you know, clicks on your Instagram and certain things like that. Um, give yourself a little bit of grace and define what that looks like, knowing it is always in draft form and never final because you personally are never final. I can be found saying to both my boys, I want to grow up and be like you someday, which is obviously hilarious, but just <laughs> that, that innocence of thinking and the ability to, which is a gift to kids. They don't have a clue of what we have to struggle with. And I just actually made the assignment to my 16 year old that he was going to start managing our mint account. I wanted him to really understand where money went what it costs. We taught when we travel, when we went to Cabo, we're like, Hey, what do you think this bill was for dinner? What do you think the hotel was? And so on, which then they're of course like, mom, how's that alcohol drink? How much is that margarita? <laughs> I love it. I'm like, it's fine. I work really hard. It doesn't matter how much it work. Is. I play hard. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So I, I pivot between to your colors, gold still being in, um, I would still say peer, but being the one that's delivering and sharing the information like an executive assistant, but that I'm also, you know, driving, driving the partnership, mm -hmm. which is an honor. And people can't, like you said, people can shift and change. Like when I was in healthcare and I took this for the first time, I was very high gold because I had to be that way in my role to be good at it. But I wasn't my happiest until I got out of corporate America. I started being more creative and inventive, exactly what you were saying. Like mm -hmm. I was always in trouble for talking um, or like not doing what the teacher said to do the way the teacher said to do it. Right. And, but you know, I didn't know that at the time. And so it's like, that's, it's like, I didn't really figure out who I was until I was about 30. And I'm like, oh, this is what happiness is. And this is what I can do to be happy. And it's like, if you're not happy, like pivot. Mm -hmm. And then I do want to circle back what you just did a minute ago and, and end on this note about success looks different for everybody. So I'm in a group, uh, the entrepreneur organization, and you have to have a million in revenue in order to get yeah, a, yeah. a catalyst, um, which when I went through catalyst many years ago in 2010, you had to have, I think a hundred. Now you have to have 250 in revenue. And so they, they pound this into your head of, you have to have this to get this. And then Gary V came and spoke when the pandemic started. And he's like, you know, if you're good with five clients and you're good with that revenue and you have a comfortable lifestyle, why try to take on five more just to get more revenue because more money, more people, more problems. And it is uh -huh. the flipping truth. It is it's the so truth. true. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I, you know, I thought about that because I've always, it's been pounding into my head, you know, in order to do this, I've been in for over a decade and it's my people, you know, it's, it's my group. And then when the pandemic hit in three days, you lose over a million in revenue being in hospitality. It's like, you take a step back and it's like, shit, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. What's going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. And like taking everything that we had done over the past 20 years, and then really pivoting to what, what do businesses need now that yeah. still have to do with, like you said, giving, giving and helping and supporting and you know, it took me about two weeks to sit back. I'm like, all right, this is what we're going to do. But something you did that was really important is you listened to what people were saying to you. You listened to your audience, the introductions that you started to get. And so that's what I had to do. I had to take a step back and say, what are people asking for? What mm -hmm. do they need help with? And that's how we can pivot. We're not quite there with revenue yet, but EO, they took a step back and they're like, okay, 50, over 50% 50 of our membership just lost a hundred percent of their revenue. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, st you still need to be served by that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, mm -hmm. we needed that the most. So they're not going to say, you know, they gave a grace of, I think like 24 months, like, but the whole point is having the conversation of growth mm -hmm. and growth isn't always exactly what you said in the revenue. It's what value am I bringing to the table for a mm -hmm. client Am I able to live my life 
comfortably provide for other people and be happy. And that may not look like a million in revenue to some people. And that's okay. Like there right. are other groups out there, yeah. but I think that's really important for anybody listening or watching. Like you have to define what your success is going to look like. Don't compare your today to my today or your today, like really think about, and, and for new entrepreneurs, they don't even know what that's. If you asked me 15 years ago, what does success look like? I'm like, oh, we did 250 events this year and right. I'm about dead. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like really thinking about that, I think is really important. Yeah. And I like that we're uh, kind of closing out here as, you know, a lot of the things that we've covered, I'm hoping have just been sparking energy. Right. And then, of course, we're always in a state of learning. We're always in the state of evolving and gaining information. You had mentioned one of the neat things about your listeners is some of them have been doing their business for a while. And so I want to actually start with that as my answer. I've looked at other people in the community, the large firms that do recruiting, I prefer the term headhunting. They're still here. Yeah. Right. They are still around. And there's some other firms that are small. I'd like to think I'm boutique. I'm very specialized in what I do. I don't believe I have competition because I don't do it like the others because I'm me. And that mm-hmm. is the biggest thing that's lost on new entrepreneurs. You are special. Like I was mentioning with the ballerinas, right? Are you the one hanging upside down? Are you the risk taker? Are you different? What is your one draw that helps other people feel energized? And um, there's a book that I was given by my bookkeeper. It's called The Company of One by Paul Jarvis, J-A, I just pulled it up, J-A-R-V-I-S. And I'm a company of two because I have an assistant. Um, I could be a company of 12 someday, but it was extremely powerful to read because it's on this tone of how do you measure success? One of the quick stories was an individual who had a goal of how much revenue the person needed to make to have that joyful life, right? Versus the burnout of 250 events. He was paddleboarding up in Canada, the author and this individual, The individual, because the author was like, hey, you know, what are your goals for third and fourth quarter? He's like, I've made my revenue for the year. I'm on vacation for the rest of the year. And I stopped at that page. I was like, what? What? (laughs) What are you talking about? Hello? No. Uh, Are you going to write a book then in that time? And I was like, but he knew what he wanted. And so how do I bring that in? And when I was in Cabo, I was, you know, standing there at the ocean and it was just so phenomenal. I was like, what is all of my hard work for? And so you guys listening really identify, is it a phone call a week? Is it 10 phone calls a year, right? Really creating and manifesting what you will look back at that tells you you were successful and kind of move away from revenue. Um, That way you give yourself more um, grace and authority of how you are going to feel. Mindset is so key. And if we have such a rigid mindset, we're creating a a suffocating uh, philosophy and then we're disappointed and then we're going to get discouraged and then we're going to kind of hunker down and be a hermit. And then we're going to like, forget doing another Instagram reel. I'm not in it today. And mindset is key, which is connected to growth and don't compare yourself to someone who's got years on you. I mean, just for the sake of where I'm now in my fifth year, I have progressed forward. Uh, I was able to sustain still being a business in 2020. And I was like, gosh, if the phone rings a couple of times and I do a few placements, I'm still successful because to the point of the people who've been doing it a long time, the phone is still ringing for them. That means that they're successful. And uh, I hope that you guys think about that revenue as not the only methodology to decide if you're successful or not, especially in those first few years, Um, get your name out there, right? Make a reputation for yourself and recognize, you know, what is your unique gift? Because I believe that everyone has something special to offer. And just because you have revenue does not mean you're profitable. Uh, Isn't that the truth, right? Like what's in the green, what's in the red, what's your overhead, you know? And then some of those are like, God, do I get an assistant yet or not? 
And it really goes down to where's your energy going. Um, and then also in the book of Company of One, he mentions he's got several subcontractors, right? He's not great at marketing. So he brought in someone like Angela, right? He doesn't, you know, have uh, events and he needs to have constant workshops. So he, you know, subs that out, contracts that out. So those types of things are key. And then some of you might be rolling your eyes like, well, I don't have any money to afford that. Sit down and evaluate what you're great at and then capitalize on that for as long as possible so you can have some cash in the bank to pay for your first subcontractor that's going to help you expand and then expand. Um, I gave away, as I mentioned in my first lead strike, bookkeeping was bye, goodbye. Someone else yeah. is going to do it because I'm just Me not going to be great at it. And she was my appointment before you. And I was just like, I can't, I'm watching her on the screen. I'm like, I'm so glad you love doing that. Uh-huh. Because I don't. No, I don't either. Yeah. That's the first thing. Yeah. Getting somebody to do the invoices and the numbers and then, but then also getting that person to talk to our business manager who like oversees everything and getting those two together. And then them looking at me and saying, you're working so much and you're doing all this and you're really not making a profit. Like we need to go back to figure out a different business model and quit saying yes to everything. Uh, and it, yeah. but it almost took 10 years for me to get there. And so that, and now I'm like delegate outsource as much as possible. Um, it gives other people opportunities. And when you know the business model and you know, your numbers and not aside from just revenue, but you know, your numbers, how much it costs daily to run the company then that's how we've been able to expand. I didn't do that on my own. It was, a, it was way smarter people yeah. who were not creatives. They're like, this right. is the data and this is what you need to do. And the data doesn't lie, even though it's not always fun, it doesn't lie and it's not sexy, but mm -hmm. it works. It does. It works. it works. And I have to say that if you do have your bookkeeper be your first one, have that person love bookkeeping. I'm just, so, she's actually a, a girlfriend of mine. And she just makes me smarter. And that's how we are serving, you know, our clients. And if they're just excited about plugging in numbers, you may not be giving yourself the right um, full return uh, on what it is that your bookkeeper is doing for you. So knowing the revenue, knowing the expenses, knowing your margins and things like that, she's made me smarter. Um, I will, and I have no desire to be as smart as she is I'm on the topic of accounting, but, you know, think about that. If that's maybe your first hire beside, uh, before a VA, do they love talking about helping you with the finances of your business? Yeah. And it, that the bookkeeper could be the person to help you set up your numbers so if I, when I hear people, they're like, I can't afford that. And I'm like, well, mm. wait a minute. You go to Starbucks every F and day, sometimes twice a day. And let's just add those things up. It's like, you don't need that. And I mean, that's just the example right. off the top of my head. And it's like, you can't afford not to hire someone to help you because you can't grow. You can't do this on your own. So it, it's just, it's so important. Mm -hmm. I, I could talk talk your ear off all day long, but oh, I'm getting this has a been so exciting. Yeah. yeah. Gotta go. Gotta go. Thank you. Angela. Where can people, wonderful. what's your favorite? Platform? I love Where everyone. Can people connect? Everyone can go straight to the website, exceptional admins with an S at the end.com. And there's just a wealth of information. There's an article section, my podcast. If you want to kind of understand how a great administrative individual thinks, there's a lot of episodes for that. Um, I have a couple CEOs too, if you want to uh, hear about how that is. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm more soft on uh, Instagram. I rarely use Facebook, so I don't know if I'm actually missing out on opportunity, uh, but my audience is a bit hybrid. And so just really understanding your audience and you know who you want to be talking to is key. So visit uh, exceptionaladmins.com and you'll be able to learn a lot more and, and receive more uh, from that uh, initial source. Thank you awesome. so much. This was wonderful. Yay. And we'll put all of the links in the show notes. So if you guys are driving or biking, don't worry, we'll put it all there. And thank you so much for watching or listening today and be sure to tune in next week to another episode of Business Unveiled. Bye y'all. That's it for this week's episode of Business Unveiled. 
Now that you have all the tools that you need to conquer the world and GSD, get shit done, would you share this with your friends and fellow business leaders? One thing that would really, really help us and help new listeners is for you to rate the show and leave a comment in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you tune in and listen to Business Unveiled. You can check out the show notes at angelaprofit.com slash podcast and link up with us on social media so you can share your biggest insights and I want to know your aha moments. Until next week, remember the profitable shifts and structures you're creating in your business help you be more present in your life. So get out there and GSD.